This episode of Working is brought to you by Progressive. Maybe you're driving your car or doing laundry right now. I mean, a lot of people like to bundle podcasts together with another activity. The same way that Progressive bundles home and auto policies. They're great when they're bundled, too. Having these two policies together makes insurance easier and could help you save. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. Quote a home and car bundle today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. This episode is brought to you by Bank of America. From a local business to a global corporation, partnering with Bank of America gives your operation access to exclusive digital tools, award-winning insights, and business solutions so powerful you'll make every move matter. Visit bankofamerica.com slash bankingforbusiness to learn more. What would you like the power to do? Bank of America N.A. Copyright 2023. I mean, when in doubt, I think, you know, for our listeners at home, add a cute dog or a scary monkey. <laughs> you know, you don't know what to do. It worked for Nope. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, Nate Chinen. And I'm your other host, Isaac Butler. Isaac, whose voice was that at the top of the show? I'm glad you asked, Nate. That was Daniel Hornsby. He's a novelist. Uh, His second novel, Sucker, which we'll be talking a lot about in the interview, just came out. And his first novel, Via Negativa, which is also quite wonderful, is is available in stores right now. So he's a very talented novelist. And why did you want to talk to Dan? Well, I wanted to talk to him for a few reasons. First of all, Dan's an old friend. He's a big fan of the show. You know, he really understands working as a podcast. And so I thought it would be really interesting to talk to him about, you know, the craft of writing and everything. And also, I just really loved this new book. It's really different from his first one, which we talk about a little bit in this episode. And I was just really interested in how he built its world, how he thought about genre, you know, how he thinks about writing. Because, you know, he's a novelist. I'm a nonfiction writer. We approach it from sort of two different directions, and I just thought we'd have a lot to talk about. Oh, this is going to be good. And I'm guessing that you also have an extra segment exclusively for Slate Plus members. What is that this week? It's amazing that you knew that, Nate. It's like just incredible. Your your powers of foresight are, are Promethean. Just tuned in. Yeah. <laughs> we talk about a few different things, you know, a few extra tidbits. First, Dan is married to Alice Boleyn, who's an extremely gifted essayist and nonfiction writer. She's the author of Dead Girls, which was a New York Times notable book of 2018. And so we talk about, you know, what is it like when you're partner in life is in the same creative field as you. How do you shape each other's work and stuff like that? And then we talk a bit about how to get unstuck when you are creatively blocked. If you're a member of Slate Plus, you will hear that at the end of the episode. And if you are not, it is so easy to join. As a Slate Plus member, you get to hear extra segments on this show and others like Decoder Ring and Culture Gabfest. You will hear bonus episodes of podcasts like Slow Burn and Big Mood, Little Mood. And, of course, you will never, ever hit a paywall on Slate.com. To learn more, go to Slate.com slash Working Plus. All right, let's hear Isaac's conversation with Daniel Hornsby. Daniel Hornsby, thank you so much for joining us this week to talk about your process right here. I'm working. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. So let's just start kind of generally, I guess. You're, a, among other things, but primarily a writer. Is there like a typical writing day for you? And, and if so, what does that look like? Yeah. So my days are kind of flexible. So usually in the morning, I go to this coffee shop that my friend owns kind of by the Mississippi River on East Lake Street in Minneapolis. And I'll kick it there for a while and usually like kind of ride the caffeine out, read something good to kind of get inspired. And then I'll work for a couple hours. Sometimes it's a, it's like longer than I think. It might be like four or five hours. And then I'll, you know, come home, 
clean, go to the gym, do whatever I need to do to like be a good partner. And then at night, I go to this kind of dingy bar and I'll work there. Sometimes just like get a soda and bitters and do a little more loose stuff, you know, like try things out. It gets a little like weirder there. Sometimes, you know, a guy will come up to you and tell you to like read all of Theodore Sturgeon or something, you know, just like weird stuff like that happens. <laughs> right. And then every now and then I'll take a couple days just to kind of think and read and research. Theodore Sturgeon specifically. <laughs> no, 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 no. This one guy uh, is like a hardcore sci-fi dude and he's always just like slamming the Sturgeon on me. I don't know. Amazing. Amazing. So when you're at the bar, is that like a notebook and a pen, not a laptop? It just depends. Like my normal kind of cycle is that I like to draft things by hand. It just like commits me to stuff. I don't know if the physical thing just helps me think kind of in a linear way. Because after a while, I think with a novel, you start to see it like in this kind of atemporal way. It's like you you zoom out and you can see everything at once and you lose the kind of like weird phenomenology that a reader is going to get. Right. And so I think it's really nice to lay the like one thing in front of another sequentially as you start out. And it's kind of cool to have like a little notebook so early in the process where you're just trying to make that notebook not be full of shit. For me, writing longhand, which I often do at like the beginning of a big project and then eventually do it less and less and less. To me, it's like I can find the voice easier when I'm handwriting. I can't explain it. It's totally ephemeral, but there's something about it being like a physical act that involves so much of my body that yeah. like a voice starts to come out of it somehow. Totally, totally. I think there is something about the kind of like physical connection between your brain and your arm and hand and eyes. Yeah, that makes it work for me. And then you can have like little drawings or you can tape some stuff in there. You, know, you photocopied something, you can tape it in there. And then, I mean, I think the beauty of that too, and maybe you found this, is like by the time you've transferred it into the computer, you're at draft two. I know, it's so great. You get the free, I mean, it's not free, but it feels like a free rewrite. Right. It feels like you've cheated somehow. And you can start moving things around and like the difference between like what should just be the transferred from notebook to computer draft is always right. so much better and weirder because you just like don't let things sit still. Yeah, totally, totally. So we're going to mostly talk about your second book, Sucker. Can you talk a little bit about where the idea for the book came from? Like, I know where your ideas come from is like the second worst question behind how long did it take you to write it? But where do your ideas come from and how long did it take you to write it? <laughs> it's like, oh. They come directly from angels. Uh, no, it's, it really started as a joke with my friends, you know, oh, like, what if Elizabeth Holmes was a vampire? And I was just, we were just kind of kicking that around. And then it just, like, became the lens through which I saw, like, our relationship with tech at this kind of, like, hopefully late stage in its life, you know, at least the current kind of tech cycle. Mm. Where it's like, oh, you have, not only do you have, like, Elizabeth Holmes dealing directly with, like, little bags of blood, Right. But you have Peter Thiel maybe injecting himself with teen's blood. You have all of these quests for immortality among the super rich, um, whether that's like flying into space to become kind of robo lords or just living forever. Yeah. And there's that guy who like has spent his whole fortune on being younger and he like took blood transfusions from his son. Yeah, he and it's funny, like, you put all that money into it and you still kind of look like the dude from The Room. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> you still look kind of vampiric, dude. And then you have, you know, even just text relationship in our lives, like uh, kind of the siren server, data mining without our consent usually, and the relationship of venture capital, I think, to our culture. It just all felt so mm. parasitic. And the, like, kind of more I read and the more I thought about it, I, I was like, oh, I can kind of commit to this bit until I can blow it up a little bit. Yeah, you know, that's that's interesting. One of the things that I love asking people is like, when do you know the idea will sustain a novel, right? Because a novel is a, you know, that's a two to five year commitment, right. right? You know, sometimes more. Like you said, this just started out as like a bit you were doing with a friend. right? How does it, you know, leap through that membrane and, and become something big enough to sustain a novel? I know. I always think about it and tell students it's like kind of like packing for a hike. Where, like, if you have just a Snickers bar, you can go really far, really fast, and then you just die of starvation. And if you try to tow a refrigerator, you're going to have everything you need, but you're going to get, like, half a mile and just pass out and quit, right? Like, if you try to just pack too much from the jump. 
I mean, I've seen a lot of people toil, like they've done all of this research, but they don't really have a way into it. I think for me, you know, my narrator is a little bit outside of my parallel universe, you know, Holmes world. So he's a kind of billionaire scion heir who finds employment at this, you know, evil tech startup to kind of get money from his trust and keep his punk label going. So having that remove and realizing like he participates in this world in another way, I thought kind of created enough of an engine for me because I could kind of juggle. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Elizabeth Holmes and a lot of these tech guys, they're just kind of empty. Like, you know their motivations. They want more wealth and power, right? And so having someone a little outside who can kind of observe the black hole of this person and try to figure out what they're doing was more interesting to me. You know, the kind of like classic... Nick Carraway, yes. Gatsby angle. Yeah, yeah. The Nick character, which is the the sidekick who is the narrator, is a really useful device, I think. I think so, yeah. So I can tell from reading Sucker that you've read Bad Blood because there's like mm-hmm. little parody details from John Carreyou's book that wind up in there. But I'm wondering what else the research process was was like for you because it's not literally Theranos plus vampires. So I imagine there's a lot of other research that went into it. Yeah, for sure. So one thing that was really helpful, I read this book called Wealth Without Borders. It was by an anthropologist and she she just like immersed herself in the wealth management class and studied them as a like a anthropological group. And these are the people that move the money around for the super rich. Oftentimes, like if you have a billionaire, he doesn't really know where his money is, right? It's these people, sometimes teams of people, sometimes single family offices that know that it's like in Switzerland and some of it's in Singapore and some of it's in the Caymans, some of it's over here in a holding company, right? And so reading that book kind of illuminated like the actual flows of wealth, like what that mysterious money is doing, because it's like, well, here are people who, what do they value most money? Let's track that money and understanding how it moves is going to tell us a lot about them. And there are a lot of really crazy little anecdotes in there. Like uh, this one billionaire, she was looking for a wealth manager and her kind of like quest for them, this impossible task that they needed to complete was, I just left a restaurant in London and lost my bracelet, find it for me. And then this person had to figure out where she went, figure out where she liked to go, her haunts, and get this bracelet and recover it. It was just crazy. That was the test? That was the test. Amazing. That was it. And I I guess she passed it. Another guy requested, like, I think thousands of pounds of locks in three days. Like, can you get it? You mean smoked salmon, not not padlock. Yeah, 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 yeah. Smoked salmon. So he wanted, like, a ton of smoked salmon. And she used her, like, connections with Cisco and, like, weird supply chain math with Scotland and got it. That's so wild. That was one way in. The other thing that was really probably the most interesting bit of research, um, while I was working on the book, you know, I would I was living in Memphis at the time, and I would go to this other dingy, very fun little bar called the Lamplighter, and there would be these uh, people working on their like philosophy dissertations and stuff, and we would just kind of hang out and peck at our computers and talk about stuff. And after a while, I was I told my friend what I was working on, and he's like, oh yeah, do you know that? This person you've been like working beside, she had married a billionaire um, and divorced out of it. And so I talked to her for like four hours one day and conducted a very serious interview that gave me access to some like very interesting textural details, right? Because like we have so much kind of uh, rich people porn in the culture and you don't really want to get all of the kind of like succession secondhand shit. So it's really nice to like, what is it like at the dinner table? What are you eating? What is the place like? She mentioned how the housekeeper would iron the bed sheets when she made the bed. They had a Picasso sketch in their like basement bathroom. That's one that makes it into the book. Charles Gross's parents keep a very ugly, like third rate Picasso in, in the bathroom. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Good memory. You know, that's interesting. What you point to there is there's the kind of research where you get books from the library or, you know, you use your academic email address to access JSTOR and, you know, keyword search some good terms. JSTOR is the the most priceless resource known to man is, is JSTOR. Oh, my God. It's perfect. But then there's also this other thing, which is like the actual what is the texture of the world like? Right. That really takes a different kind of research. Not that the other one is lesser or anything, but you really need both to like kind of get into 
the thing that you want to write about or make art about. And they anchor each other, right? right? Because if you have like the right tiny detail, then it kind of cantilevers the maybe stranger ideas or textures that you're also trying to get in there. Right. I think some people worry sometimes with research that they'll get too hung up on on authenticity. You know what I mean? Because there is that mm-hmm. trap because you're writing something that's a work of fiction. So you want to be able to take those flights right. of fancy. Do you find that the research helps actually ground the flights of fancy? For sure. I mean, there's some things, you know, I think going into a project, especially a novel, is like figuring out what the kind of like domain of your invention is going to be like Mm -hmm. if you're writing a a new york book is it going to be on a street that exists right are you going to make your own little street your own little zone that's squeezed between two blocks that actually exist or are you going to make your own borough right or are you going to make your own parallel universe new york like you can kind of figure that out and i think that applies to almost any book right like are you making up a town is this in a town that that exists is this in a state that we know about And so once you have those parameters, then I think it's nice to have like the actual stuff leak into that zone Mm -hmm. to kind of root it. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. That makes sense to me. We'll be back with more of Isaac's conversation with Daniel Hornsby. This episode is brought to you by Bank of America. If you own or operate a business, whether it's a local operation or a global corporation, partnering with Bank of America could be your smartest move. By teaming with Bank of America, you'll enjoy exclusive digital tools, award-winning insights, and business solutions so powerful, you'll make every move matter. Position your business to capitalize on opportunity in a moment's notice. Visit bankofamerica.com slash bankingforbusiness to learn more. What would you like the power to do? Bank of America, N.A., copyright 2023. At the end of your first year, Discover credit cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you earned doubled. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant doubled. All the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned to snowboard also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope. Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. Listeners, we want to hear from you. Every other Thursday on Working Overtime, we answer listener questions. So please tell us your creative challenges and let us help you. Drop us a line at working at slate.com. You can also send a voice memo to that address or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK. And if you're enjoying this episode, don't forget to subscribe to Working wherever you get your podcasts. Now let's return to Isaac's conversation with Daniel Hornsby. So, you know, you mentioned earlier that your narrator, Charles Gross, his real name, Charles Grosshart, right? His family is basically like the Koch brothers, right? They're an incredibly evil multinational <laughs> petrochemical right. empire. And he is the uh, the scion, the sort of prodigal son who's sort of changed his name. And none of his friends know he's a billionaire and he's actually running a experimental punk noise record label called Obnoxious Records. I, la- I mean, it's just, anyway, where did he come from? Were you just thinking about this idea and suddenly you heard that voice in your head one day? Or were you like, the idea of this particular narrator entering this particular world, where'd that come right. from and how'd you develop his voice? Totally. Well, so when I started thinking about like who could tell the kind of story of this vampiric pseudo Theranos, I thought about like some of the people who show up in Bad Blood. So you have someone who is like the grandson of a diplomat who was on the board who had like integrity. That's the thing. Yeah. Like he had the thing that his grandpa supposedly valued. Right. And I thought, oh yeah, there are these kind of like favors that powerful people will kind of, uh, you know, give to one another, employ each other's children, things like that. Give each other a leg up and kind of, you know, pay each other off. And then I thought about all of these people I've just known, you know, playing in bands in the past, being kind of music scene adjacent, who would have these kind of funny stories. And they're really everywhere, I think, in the kind of like, at least in the punk or like indie rock world. So I think really everywhere, though, in music, where like I was living in Ann Arbor, I knew this guy in a kind of emo punk band. And he was telling me this story about how his friends recorded an album and and received an advance that was kind of ungodly. Where they're like, where is this money from? Oh, well, we'll just make our little record. And they're making a punk record. Right. It's not Steely Dan. 
<laughs> right. And then it turns out months later that like Martin Screlly was funding the label. Oh my God. And they didn't know that? They had no idea Incredible. that they were like using this HIV medication money to record their songs, you know, about authority. And then, you know, there are other kind of instances of that, but Screlly is a really fascinating case. And he became one of the like uh, models in the Chuck pantheon for me. This kind of powerful bro who wants to be art adjacent, but can't quite figure that out. Right. And then you think back and you have the like Peggy Guggenheims, you have a lot of rich people who have uh, these interesting relationships with artists and some like Peggy Guggenheim, she helped a lot of artists. Like I'm I'm not going to just shit on her wholesale, but you do see this relationship between the rich and artists. And we often think, oh, the Medici's, you have patrons, you have to go beg them for money and like paint like a really flattering painting of them so you can have a house or whatever. But I think rich people actually need art to kind of bolster their own sense of authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. Like the super rich are so insulated from how everyday people live that like art with its kind of uh, hyper authentic claims or whatever, I think it makes them feel like they're actually getting a taste of something real. Yeah. Um, And they need it too. And not just for like weird banking. Though that doesn't hurt. (laughs) I want to go deep a little bit on narrator here because both of your novels are first person, right? But the Mm -hmm. narrators could not be more different. Via Negativa's narrator is, he's not quite elderly, but he's getting on in years and he's a priest, right? He's Mm -hmm. a, he's a Catholic priest wrestling with his kind of desire for, for vengeance on this, this very odd road trip where he nurses an injured coyote. And uh, in this, you have, Chuck Gross, the Martin Screlly, he is obnoxious. He runs obnoxious records. He's kind of self-loathing, revels in the difficult sides of his personality, has an odd level of self-knowledge. How do you develop those voices? How do you figure out this sentence feels like something Chuck Gross specifically would say? You know, is it is it all impulse yeah. or is that something you figure out in revision is it about you know verb choice like how do you get into the nitty-gritty of the character i really like that question one thing i did for both projects really in the early stages sometimes i would just write almost like a micro essay on a on a subject from the point of view of either chuck or or this priest where it'd be like okay like what's this state of punk music this is something that will come up for this narrator, how does he think about it? What's his relationship? And then kind of throwing my voice there, you know, on like maybe a postcard or in the notebook. And I could do it almost topically, you know, thinking about, okay, like who's his favorite band? That will surely be something that will be in the book. Let's just let him talk about it. And you can kind of figure out why this person with this background would like this thing. And for the priest in Via Negativa, it was similar where there were kind of ideas about theology and practice, you know, you're like actual holding your religious ideas or spiritual ideas against the kind of ugly world of your life and finding that friction. And so I was able to do that maybe in a quieter way with him. Mm -hmm. But that stuff, I mean, almost always winds up in the book somehow in this kind of exploratory way. So I don't know, it lays the groundwork. And then once the, the plot kind of comes in, it's very easy to string them kind of along that thread. Interesting. Is voice something you focus on in revision, you know, making sure that it feels authentic to the character or whatever? Yeah, like, would they say that? Yeah, 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 totally. In Via Negativa, the narrator is really in denial. And Chuck also is in denial, but he's also a liar. So I think the real challenge there was, like, he's a liar talking about another liar. How do I keep track of the thing kind of behind these two veils? (laughs) Totally. And the lies about them. Like, I I just told myself, like, you have to know that. Yeah. Right? Like, you can't just let this um, narrative escape you. And so that was kind of the strangest, like, intellectual challenge of writing the book. It's just, like, keeping track of these things and making sure that the lies they tell make sense to them. Right. Well, and the way Chuck's lies work, which is that he's sort of performatively self-aware is part of the the trick, right? He's the kind of guy who's like, right. well, you're not going to call me an asshole. I'm going to call me an asshole before you get a chance to do so. Exactly. Yeah. His, his relationship with punk music is really a big part of that, where it's like, fuck everything, nothing matters, to the point where it's like, yeah, his father is, you know, Lex Luthor. And it, it's like, <laughs> well, that doesn't fucking matter. Right, <laughs> you right. Know? Yeah, totally, totally. What were you most curious about 
your own story or characters, you know, as you were writing it? Because I, I know you're a curious person. One of the things I think is really interesting about people who are working on long form fictional projects or large fictional projects is you are creating the thing, but there are also like questions you have that it answers for you and they don't feel like they come from you. Do you know what I mean? I'm sort of interested in what those questions and points of curiosity were. You know, I think if you knew exactly what you wanted to like put in a novel, you would never write it. Like you have to have some kind of unknown territory to explore, right? Yeah, because otherwise what's going to keep you interested for three years or whatever, right. right? Yeah, it's like every word's in your head. And so with this, I've been really fascinated kind of just on like a, I guess you could say rhetorical level with like how the language of tech has infiltrated really everything. Like if you just go to a university, that language is everywhere. This kind of like disruption idea, this focus on, you know, STEM yeah. and even structurally, right? Like reducing the amount of like tenure track jobs in exchange for adjunct labor. I guess on the level of language, I was just really curious, like, could I capture some of those rhythms in a kind of ironic way? Could I ventriloquize like how these people talk, which is usually in some kind of weird dialect of TED? Yeah. And and Olivia, your Elizabeth Holmes uh, stand in has that, you know, Holmesy and those mantras and sayings on the walls uh -huh. of, the, of the office. It's like your version of that BS motivational speak. Exactly. And also, you know, the book is set in Thomas Pynchon's uh, San Narciso and kind of picks up 60 years later. And, you know, it was interesting in just kind of figuring out those kind of, kinds of connections between, like, one vision of kooky California then mm -hmm. and how all of these, like, new agey ideas, utopian ideas have become distorted or embodied by people living in the same place now. Yeah. That brings up a, another question I have for you about the sort of intertextual play in the novel, right? My favorite one is, of course, the reference to uh, Joseph Roth's The Hero of Solferino, who's the main character of the, the first part of the Radetzky March, makes an appearance. You're in uh, San Narciso from Thomas Pynchon. I mean, we could probably go on and on and on. What made you decide to kind of live in the margins of those other texts? I've, I've always been inspired by this thing that I heard Francis Ford Coppola say, where, like, at least in his imperial run, he would have a kind of word that embody the ideas of a project, but it was like very, very simple, right? Like I think in the conversation, for example, it was privacy. And so, you know, if you're a director and I think it's true if you're, if you're writing fiction too, you're making just hundreds of little decisions, you know, every time you sit down. And so he had this as a kind of lodestar for him. And so in the conversation, you know, Gene Hackman has to wear a trench coat to go outside and the costume designer is like, okay, here's a brown one, here's a black one. Which one do you want to use? And he's like, okay, privacy. And so they use the famous clear trench coat, right? I just find that so inspiring. And so I kind of like come to, if not using it like one word, at least have a little kind of geometry or a little amulet. So it could be a word, it could be a kind of a configuration of objects that I carry with me when I'm trying to make decisions about like what characters could do, say, where they should go. And so for this one, it's parasitism, right? Like feeding off of other things. And I thought like it would be interesting if like this book could exist in a kind of parasitic relationship. We know that books are built on kind of other books. And I thought it would be fun and still kind of thematically relevant if this could like literally suck some of the blood out of The Crying of Lot 49 and the larger pension verse, you know, and be its own little vampire. You know, I've been thinking about twists a lot and big reveals and, and how often they wreck a project, oh you know, and you've taught undergraduate creative writing, you know, how often people think that's what you've got to do, right? Now, your book sort of has a twist, which is these people are vampires, right? But the right. reader actually knows that almost immediately, right? It, it like, right. And if they don't know, the marketing for the book is very open about the fact that these people are vampires, down to you have the... Uh, you know, the Anne Rice interview with the vampire font is uh, is very close to <laughs> right. the one that the that the book's title is in. So you're not we're not hiding that they're vampires, but Chuck doesn't figure it out until very, very late. Walk me through making that decision and figuring out how to, you know, tip the reader off 
and let the reader know in a sense, like you haven't ruined the book by figuring out that these people are vampires 50 pages in or whatever. You know, I think anytime you sit down to like see a horror film, you kind of know the genre space you're entering. Because they've told you it's a horror film, right? Yeah, they're like, A24, you know. Right. One thing I really like about the horror genre, though, is like, if you sit down and watch a horror movie, like, you know, this isn't going to end well. Like, shit is going to hit the fan. And I think that irony is just like, I find it deeply funny. And I'm not the first person to say this, but like horror and comedy are like twin genres, right? Right. Like, one is the sun, one's the moon. And often the beats of horror and the beats of horror films especially, like, are, like, jokes. To the point where early in every horror film there's a jump scare that isn't really the monster, right? It's like two teens going through an abandoned house and one goes, boo. And it's just to get that rise out of you. And the effect of that is a joke, right? Because you're expecting a monster, you get their friend. And where, where one has slapstick, the other has, like, gore, Right. I don't know. I always like kind of love being able to see over a narrator's head. There's something about the kind of like complexity of that yeah. that I think cleaves nicely to that like effect in in the horror genre in general. And so I don't know. I tried to marry the like comic ironic narrator who you can kind of peek around with the irony of horror where you're like, there's a monster. Why are you going to that cabin? Why are you on that empty boat? That kind of thing. <laughs> Why, yeah, right, right. Why are you in this uh, town where there's no cell reception? Right. There's like one guy and a bunch of wax dolls. I think you should peace out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Both of your novels are so in dialogue with the genre in which they, they find themselves. Not in an obnoxious metafictional way, but I just mean like, you can tell that Via Negativa is written by someone who knows what a road novel is, right? Has read Charles Portis's Dog of the South. Right. You can tell that you've read corporate satire, that you've read horror fiction and stuff like that. How actively do you think about genre? Like, you know, are you watching a bunch of horror movies and outlining them to see how they work? Is it like that schematic or is it just you read a lot of it and it kind of goes in through osmosis? Yeah, I, you know, like I had a very intense Catholic upbringing, I guess I'll say. And so like horror films always had this allure, you know, as a kid, I saw The Exorcist and then I slept with the Bible, like, like a teddy bear beside me in bed for like a year, you know, cause it was on like TNT or something. Yeah. So I've always had a fascination with that genre and what it can do. I think for me, that kind of entry into whatever the genre space is really comes from like the ideas that I want to kind of get tangled in. Mm. And so, you know, the Via Negativa, that title, like, means the negative road, right? And that's this kind of tradition of mystical thought in Christianity. And so I'm like, well, that should be on a road. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) it makes sense. That kind of, like, it has to be a road novel. And then for Sucker, it was kind of the same way where I'm like, this is horrifying. (laughs) And also, it was a way in because it's like, I've never really worked in tech I talked to a guy who does a lot of kind of nanotech stuff and is in the loop on that. I tried to make sure the details were close enough to create a satisfying illusion. The horror space really lets me like go a little crazier and dial things up. You know, you mentioned your intense Catholic upbringing. You went to divinity school. I did. yeah, And to get your MFA. I'm curious about you're going to divinity school directly influences via negativa, right? But I'm Mm -hmm. interested in sort of how religious scholarship informs your creative practice. I would say, obviously, novelists, you're thinking about the nature of language and reality, you know, like, how do we map on the interiority of a person onto the larger world. How do we describe these things that are physically happening or invisibly happening with language and make those kind of maps? And that's a very old question that like gets to, you know, the root of religion in a way. And there are like thousands of years of, of writing and scholarship on, you know, those subjects. And so I've always been kind of fascinated in that little like dance, the via negativa, the kind of the negative road, the negative way looks at that kind of more explicitly, like thinking about like, what are the limits of language? What's beyond language? Uh, What can't be described? Yeah. And I am also kind of fascinated with like people who have strange religious ideas and then have to kind of like figure them out in the space of their lives. And that is, you know, one of the big projects of the novel, I think, historically. 
so yeah, I, I kind of see the Div School thing as just kind of a natural outgrowth of the MFA. Mm. I really went into it as a writer and it illuminated things for me and helped me also kind of have more of a capacity for like sitting beside some of the mysteries that naturally come out of just being alive. Yeah, you really hit on something there, which is that so much of art is about describing the undescribable or trying to yeah. portray or dramatize or touch things that are unknowable or exist beyond language or beyond the senses. It's not just writing, you know, like a lot of acting is about that. A lot of painting is about that. The ineffable and the impossible. And how do you contain those parts of human experience that don't that don't want to be contained, which is, of course, also impossible. You also can't do it on some level. Right. It's interesting that you just decided to really take the bull by the horns on that one and make that kind of like the subject of your life for a while while you were in school. Yeah. Well, and it just was like part of my fascination as a child and definitely part of why I, I think I wanted to become an artist. Hmm. And so those things, I think, have always been in conversation, even though I don't really identify with any like particular tradition, let's say. Right, right. Another thing that I know is really part of your process is is visual art, that you do a lot of drawing, and part of your writing process is to draw things that are happening in the books and stuff like that. Can you just talk a little bit about, about that part of your process and how it works? I think drawing and writing especially have this kind of funny fundamental relationship was like the reduction of a lot of noise, a lot of stuff into lines and whether those are like, like actual lines that have weight and ink or they're written lines. There's like, what do you highlight? What do you leave out? How do you capture the essence of a thing? And so by kind of switching modes where you're like, well, maybe I'll just draw a portrait of this character. Then you realize like, oh, what is their hair like? You have to answer questions you haven't asked yet. You haven't had to answer them you know, in your manuscript, where it's like, oh, like, what is Chuck's hairline? You know, and then you're like, oh, he's, 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 he's balding. Okay, cool. He'll make some jokes at his own expense, or he's wearing a hat in this scene. You begin to answer questions you haven't asked. And I think that gives you this extra degree of resolution on your world. And sometimes you can solve problems that way. You know, my partner, Alice Bolin, the essayist, she makes really extensive webs. They look kind of like hyper Kabbalistic webs, you know, where the ideas are all touching each other. And I find that really inspiring. And so if like, f if I get stuck trying to figure out what I'm trying to say, or if I need to say something else, I'll, I'll make a little web and try to figure it out. How do these different components relate? How don't they? And I, I think it just can help you fill out your world and kind of think a little differently. I've seen one of the drawings that was behind this book, which yeah, is, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think this is exactly a spoiler, but there is a part in the book where a zebra kicks a surveillance drone to death, <laughs> right? There's a, there's a drone and a zebra kicks it until it breaks apart. How did drawing that help you figure out that scene? Sure. Yeah. Well, it's like, then you're starting to think about, okay, so you have the zebra. I wanted this like actual animal destroying this kind of uh, mockery of animalness. And then they're like, well, what's in the yard? And I'm like, oh, how about we put like a little Henry Moore statue to kind of balance out the drawing a little bit. And then there's this wall and you start to get the lawn and you can just kind of build the world out from there. And so as he's approaching, you're like, oh, there's a Henry Moore statue. You know, you have these elements there that are really like dictated by the necessity of composition, right? Like this thing has to happen somewhere. What's in the background? What's going to balance out this drone in this zebra, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, Dan, it's always a pleasure to talk to you about all oh, things man. craft. Thank you so much for joining us here on Working to talk about the book and your process. It's an honor to be on here. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the podcast, so thank you. Up next, Isaac and I will talk about satirical targets, unreliable narrators, and the rules of genre. This episode of Working is brought to you by Factor. With the busy fall season just around the corner, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian-approved, 
ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Uh, listeners, you've probably heard me say this a couple times before if you're a long-time uh, working person, but I am always skeptical of food that one is supposed to heat up in the microwave uh, that is not leftovers that you cooked yourself. But I have to admit, you know, I tried Factor, they sent it to me, and I really liked it, you know, and they have a lot, a lot of options available to you. Are you a vegan? They have vegan stuff. Do you want calorie conscious stuff? They have that. You can also uh, round out your meal and replenish your snack supply with an assortment of over 45 add-ons, including breakfast items like apple cinnamon pancakes and bacon and cheddar egg bites. And for an easy wellness boost, you could even add refreshing beverage options, cold pressed juices, shakes, and smoothies. This August, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Head to factormeals.com slash working50 and use code working50 to get 50% off. That's code working50 at factormeals.com slash working50 to get 50% off. Between the kids being home and hosting, everything in our house gets used up in summer. With Instacart, I can save money by stocking up on all my favorite summer brands. I save time by getting everything delivered in as fast as an hour. And I save myself a sink full of dirty dishes by stocking up on paper plates for the annual summer cookout. Save more on summer essentials? Spend more time enjoying summer. Add summer to cart. Download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. Isaac, that was such a fascinating talk with Daniel. It really makes me want to rush out to my local bookstore and grab a copy of Sucker. And from the interview, I have a sense of the tonal landscape of the book. But I'm curious. We've seen a lot of cultural satire in the billionaire space and in the tech space. And, you know, let's say vampire fiction is also pretty familiar terrain. So when you read Dan's book, did it feel like he was pulling off some kind of a magic trick? <laughs> yeah, totally. And, you know, I think there's there's a couple things that make that magic trick work. First of all, yes, the log line is Theranos with vampires, right? But there's a right. lot of other stuff going on. There's a lot of other influences and ideas swirling around in that mix, you know? And part of that, which is the second thing that really I think makes this magic trick work, is the voice. You know, it's in first person. This character of Chuck, who's the narrator, is really well developed. He feels like a totally real and specific person, you know, the rich, hyper opinionated, self loathing aesthete, you know, and also the kind of young man who's into culture in a kind of high fidelity sort of way, right? You uh -huh. know, there, there's, there's yeah. that coming into it. He's very funny. The book is also very funny. And so because you're seeing the whole world of it and all of the events filtered through this really well-developed POV, I think it really reinvents the whole thing, frankly. That sounds really interesting. And I'm especially intrigued by the humor in that first person perspective. And that's the kind of thing that you really, you know, there's no describing it. You just have to immerse yourself in the world. Yeah. Now, you guys start out in this conversation with a little bit of groundwork. How do you write? Like, literally, how do you write? And I'm intrigued by the suggestion that writing longhand in a notebook, and Dan seems to do it often in, in noisy public spaces, might actually be a way to discover the voice of a book. And he, he also has some ingenious writerly exercises. I really liked the micro essays that he assigns his main characters, often, you know, with notes on index cards. So this leads to a question for me. Can you speak to the way that form can influence content specifically for a writer. Oh, yeah, totally. And I actually want to say you're sort of talking about two different things here. One has to do with, like, form and content, and the other is, I think, what often gets called the somatic part of writing, which is, right. you know, what's going on with your body while you write. And, in fact, there's, like, a whole genre of poetry called somatic poetry where the poets do weird things to their body and then write in whatever that physical state is. Writing really is a physical act, and so if you change the physicality, something new is going to happen. I can't explain why writing longhand helps me discover the voice of a piece, but it does, so I do it. You know what I mean? In terms of form and content, I think they're totally intertwined. And I'm actually going to go further than that and say that often when you think you're having a problem in one, you're actually having a problem in the other. The problem that you're seeing is the symptom and the disease lies in the other place. I'll give you like a really basic example. Sometimes you're writing and you're like, I don't know what 
to do next in this chapter, right? Like, I don't know where to go next in this chapter. And the actual answer is you have found the ending of the chapter and you just (laughs) need to hit insert page break chapter three or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, that's an example, a really, really basic one. There's a really wonderful nonfiction writing book called Tell It Slant that was a textbook that I used in in graduate school. And one thing about that book is that it's just filled with different forms that you can try. You know, what if you wrote this essay as a recipe? What if you did a braided essay? What if, you know, whatever it is. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that you can do as a writer, and I think this is actually true in, in, in most art forms, actually, is whatever the basic thing is you're trying to do, tell a story ask an essayistic question, uh, paint a portrait, whatever it is. Just try doing it in a bunch of different forms. Just take the rules of that form. I'm going to do this as a recipe. I'm going to do it as an instruction manual. I'm going to do it as a memoir. I'm going to do it as an interview. I'm going to do it as a play, you know, whatever it is. And just do it in all of those different forms and just see what gets unlocked by that. And you'll you'll learn an an awful lot, I think. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And you've also pinpointed something, which is the idea of genre as an articulation of form and and also something that has, you know, it comes with rules. It strikes me that Dan seems really, really savvy about how to harness elements of genre fiction, you know, or peer over the fence at genre filmmaking. And you really have to understand the rules of genre to, to know how far they'll bend without breaking. So do you think his version of that balancing act holds any lessons for the rest of us? Oh, yeah, totally. And actually, you know, June had a guest a few weeks ago who was a long-term mystery novelist, and she learned Mm -hmm. how to be a mystery novelist through, like, literally outlining the plot of P.D. James mysteries. And then she was like, oh, okay, well, you get to this point, and then this clue gets revealed, and then you get to this point, and there's this reversal or whatever, you know? Right. Rules, I think, are really helpful for being creative. They remove a bit of the choice paralysis that I think is a is a big problem of the creative process. And they create limitations and limitations actually spark your imagination because we're mischievous people who don't want to be limited. You have to remember <laughs> when you impose these rules on your work that you're the one who imposed them. So if they really fuck you up, you can just be like, oh, well, that's just a rule I made up. I can unmake it and make a different rule, you know, like, right. like as a last right. resort. You have to remember that you imposed them, but they're still important. And what what genre really gives you is a series of rules and a series of beats, you know, a structure that you can use or discard as you see fit. Of course, you know, you're a jazz person, so we should say this isn't just in writing, right? I mean, how many jazz recordings are, you know, the head, which is the pre-written part of the song, often in a blues structure, and then solos, which happen in a specific order and are improvising and not departing from the chord structure of the head, and then a return to the head at the end of the song, right? That's a million different songs. But think about how many brilliant works there are within that and how much diversity you can find within that, right? And if you can really master that form, you can do so much with it. You know, we think of the blues, it's really something so simple as a chord progression and a structure, a 12-bar blues, but there's like a million different things you can do within those rules. Well, there's another part of that, Isaac, which is that the blues is not just a form, it's also a feeling, right? Yeah, totally. totally. And, and that seems like something that in his writing, Dan really understands, you know, like I am going to work with, you know, horror tropes, or I'm going to work with, you know, satirical tropes. And, and it's like, it's not just structural, it's also like vibe. Totally. <laughs> and, and that's really, you know, that seems like a really, really potent tool in his hands. And this goes back to how form and content influence each other, right? Mm -hmm. Like, why does that chord progression contain within it that mood? You know, some of that's mysterious. I mean, we could write about it and map it out, and I'm sure you have your ideas about it. But the same is true of, like, what is it about horror fiction, about the Mm -hmm. structures of horror fiction that create the feeling of being horrified or the pleasures that we get from horror fiction? You know what I mean? Yeah. Or as he as he says, deliver sort of weird laughs. That, yeah, that, totally, you know? totally, totally, yeah. totally. I mean, a part of horror, there's always some comedy within that. Well, unless you're Thomas Ligeti, I don't think he does. You know, he's. Uh, <laughs> but but you know, but there is always sort of a, a you know comedy and horror are kind of two sides of the same coin, right? Like that's kind of the genius yeah. of a movie like Get Out, right? Is that like you have a comedy writer who sees that comedy and horror actually have the same structure, and then he uses those structures and flips them over and over and over again. You know, I also love when Dan talks about the key word that he likes to use to conceptualize a Mm -hmm. work. And in the case of Sucker, 
He says it's parasitism. And, you know, in addition to having the literal application, you know, to the vampire story, it really reframes the metafictional aspect of his work, you know, especially everything concerning Thomas Pynchon. <laughs> so so in our kind of post postmodern moment, you know, where it feels like everything's fair game, I mean, Facebook's parent company is called Meta, for crying out loud. Doesn't it feel kind of refreshing to hear an artist say, yep, I'm sucking the blood out of this thing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and so how does that forthrightness actually inform the experience of the book? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. I want to first of all say that, you know, all art is built on previous works of art. Originality we tend to misunderstand, you know? Right. Originality doesn't exist in a vacuum outside of influence. Um, there's a really wonderful essay by Jonathan Lethem called The Ecstasy of Influence that talks about mm-hmm. this really well. So listeners might want to go go seek that essay out. But specifically in Sucker's case, I think what it does is it deepens the book because the form and content and theme are all reflecting each other. You know, the action of what the book is doing on some deep level is thematically related to its plot. Now, What's great about that is that it's implicit. It's happening in the background. Dan isn't really spelling that out. I mean, he spelled it out in our interview. But but what you yeah. get as a reader is just a sense that this was made really deliberately by someone who really knew what they were doing and mm-hmm. that you're having like a deeper experience. And part of that experience is a little mysterious. And I just think that's a really, really wonderful thing. I think it also just helps in the writing process or in the creative process, I don't think it's limited to books, to do that kind of thing. I I haven't done it before, but like that is definitely a lesson I'm taking away from this interview is like, what is the word that's going to guide my next book so that when I'm stuck, (laughs) I can be like, oh, go back to, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Sandwich making. No, my (laughs) that's not going to be it, but you know what I mean. (laughs) You just alluded to mystery too. And there's a point in the interview where you guys talk about that sort of swirling mystery and how Mm -hmm. if it weren't mysterious to the writer, the work actually wouldn't get made. There's something really compelling and kind of generative about, you know, not knowing exactly what's ahead of you, which I find really true to to my own experience. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think there are some writers who really want to have everything planned out. You know, most writers I know, they have sort of some initial things planned out, some initial ideas of what they're trying to do, and then they're really discovering from there. And that's even true in nonfiction. There's stuff about the next book I'm working on where I'm like, I don't know the answer to these questions. You know, there, there's mm-hmm. things I do know the answer to. I had to find that out to write a proposal and sell the book. But the thing that's going to keep me going is actually answering the stuff I don't know. Yeah. All right. Finally, let's talk about character. Sure. Because by his own assessment... Dan has filled Sucker with, you know, pathological liars. <laughs> and and he said that one of his trickiest tasks was keeping his own eye on reality as he spun these authentic untruths. So, Isaac, you've talked a lot with actors and directors who play this kind of game. What's the key to finding the truth in an untruthful mm. character? And where does audience expectation fit in? So, as a good Stanislavskian... I have to answer that the truth of the character can be found in their actions, so in what they Mm -hmm. do, and in the needs that are motivating those actions. Characters may not be able to admit to themselves why they're doing something, or they may simply not be able to see it because they're kind of so blinkered. You know, like if you've read uh, Ishiguru, Ishiguru protagonists are usually really blinkered and don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. They don't really understand the world around them because they have a kind of ideology that's shaping it, and then you as the reader get to to see around it. Those needs, those desires, they are revealed through action. And action is is really the key. Characters are always doing something. Even when they're just thinking, there's an action to that thought. When they're talking, the speech is in action. They're trying to accomplish something. And if they're not trying to accomplish something, it's usually not worth putting on the page. And also it's through that that you can reveal stuff to the audience that the character doesn't want to reveal. Because, you know, the problem with liars or with deluded protagonists, which is slightly different, is that, you know, they don't want to be caught. There's things they do not want to look at. So the job of the author is to create the vents through which that stuff can come into the book anyway. Mm. And I have to say that as a reader... I think that's the pleasure of particularly first person fiction is where am I able to read around this person and see the things that they cannot see? I just think that's really just like 
a joyous, nurturing, wonderful process, even when it's a book that's really depressing, like Remains of the Day or Never Let Me Go, right? You know, (laughs) like those books are devastating. But the process of seeing that world come together is really pleasurable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really gives the reader a kind of power in the process of reading and and implicates (laughs) you in the story in a certain way. Yeah, totally. You have to create And it's not, I think, just in fiction or just in prose. You have to create room for the audience within the work to allow them to do a little work themselves because that kind of work is actually really pleasurable, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, that is about all the time we have this week. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, joining us, listeners. Those of you who are Slate Plus members get a little extra something right after this uh, credit sequence. And for the rest of you, what are you waiting for? Go to slate.com slash working plus today to sign up. You'll get bonus segments on shows like this one, full access behind the paywall, and the knowledge that you are supporting everything we do right here on Working. Thank you again to Daniel Hornsby and to our producer, Kevin Bendis, who is definitely no sucker, and to our series producer, Cameron Drews. We'll be back next week when June Thomas talks to Carlos Fonseca and Megan McDowell. Until then, get back to work. This episode is brought to you by Bank of America. If you own or operate a business, whether it's a local operation or a global corporation, partnering with Bank of America could be your smartest move. By teaming with Bank of America, you'll enjoy exclusive digital tools, award-winning insights, and business solutions so powerful, you'll make every move matter. Position your business to capitalize on opportunity in a moment's notice. Visit bankofamerica.com slash bankingforbusiness to learn more. What would you like the power to do? Bank of America, N.A., copyright 2023.